What's up, everybody? Welcome back to University of Adversity. We have Benjamin and Azria Becker joining us today. They are the authors of the new book called Becoming Everything You Didn't Know You Wanted. This was such a powerful book, and I'm so grateful for it because I feel that these things all come into our awareness for a reason. I was connected with these two through um, one of my mentors and his team, Aubrey Marcus, and they're also friends with him and in that network. So we were connected together through email. And when they, I had the opportunity for them to come on the show to promote the book, I said, absolutely. And since then, I've seen them you know, on Aubrey's podcast and I've seen them around and I had seen them before, I think on Instagram here and there, but I was really curious to learn more about them. So obviously I got their book. I have, don't have the hard copy because I'm in Mexico and it's, you know, it's hard to get my hands on the book with mailing address and stuff. So I got the audible and I've listened to it in the last few days and it's nothing short of remarkable. So I want to tell you guys this, if you are on a personal, personal transformational journey, you're curious about the next level of growth. You're curious about psychedelics. You're curious about stepping into the unknown, trusting the unknown, working through fear, living in truth. This book is for you. I would highly recommend anybody that is on the personal transformational journey to get this book. I don't say that very often. And I, I really, this one really hit home for me. There were so many things that I resonated with that we get into in, the, in this conversation that hit me like a bolt of lightning. And I did my best to ask questions that I think you guys will get the most use out of. I know that sometimes in the spiritual community or in the personal development community, we can use lingo that is a bit advanced. I wanted to try and make it simple for you guys to understand and walk away with the key fundamentals that you can apply in your life. And of course, grab this book. Or if you're like me and you can't grab the book, get the audio on Audible or get both, <laughs> right? That's also an option. But I really enjoyed this conversation, diving in. And, you know, like I said, it resonated with so many things. And I think you guys are going to love this because these are two very relatable, beautiful humans. And I'm grateful to have built this new relationship and, you know, potential friendship down the road, which I know I'll connect with them again at some point. So before we get into the conversation, a lot of people ask me, how can you, how can we support the show, Lance? What can we do? Well, here's what you can do. You can grab a pre-sale copy of my book, Mastering Adversity, which is available on pre-sale on Amazon. Or you can purchase Warrior Embodiment Course, which is 47 bucks, How to Embody the True Warrior Spirit in All Areas of Your Life. Also, just by leaving a review on Apple is also helpful. However you can support the work that we do is always greatly appreciated, but it's not necessary. All I ask is that if you don't want to put uh, a financial contribution to the show, just share it with somebody. Tag us on social media, tag us on Instagram, and tag us, show, share it with somebody that needs it, right? I appreciate you guys, and I would love to hear your feedback on this episode. So without further ado, enjoy this conversation with Benjamin and Azria Becker. Benjamin, Azria. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, like we were talking about before we hit record. There, there isn't many books that have really spoke to me like yours have in a long time. You know, I've started and stopped books many, many times over. You know, there was a period where I would read a lot of books. And then for the last year or so, it was, I kind of just, I don't know. I felt like I wasn't in the consuming mode. I felt like I was like, I, no book, no book could keep me interested. And with yours, right from the beginning, I was just hooked. And 
the way you guys told it, telling both of your stories, and then Azria you, narrating the book in that accent, the British accent. It was just such a powerful experience. And, you know, I felt like I really got to know you guys, mm. which was really cool because I've, I've never listened to a book that way. Mm. And there was just so, it, it was so powerful. So thank you so much for, for putting together such a, such a great book. First thank, you. thank you so much. Super appreciate the feedback. It was a, the audio book was such a journey for us. And so it's, it's beautiful to hear that it's resonating because he had severe contraction around reading his part because of his, you know, dyslexia and ADHD and all the things. It was really hard for him to read aloud. And I was like deeply questioning the, the British accent choice the whole way through. I was like, is this going to be weird? Are people going to be turned off? You know, he was like, no, do it, babe. But it was the only way that we could differentiate between my voice, his voice, and then the shared voice, the we voice. And so, because in the book, you can, you can see it visually, right? But in the audio, you have to have an auditory distinction. Otherwise, it sounds confusing. And to bring in like a third voice, to bring in someone to read that, that shared voice just didn't feel true. It would have, I think, been really jarring because it's such a personal story. So the British accent was pulled out of the closet. And because I, I used to use that back in the day when I was an actress and I hadn't dusted it off in a while. But, but yeah, I'm happy to hear that it resonated. Yeah. So I want to, I want to dive right into something like, let's go right into this, because this is something that was so, it resonated with me so much. And I know both of you have done it, and, but Ben, your experience with this really spoke to me. And I, I was running on the treadmill last night and I was like, this, when you were talking about celibacy. And you're talking about your journey and it just hit me like my entire body felt this like explosion of like, it was like goosebumps were going through, but it was more than that. It was more visceral. It was just like, and I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how I felt. <laughs> and I was like, because you were talking about this entanglement of energy that we have from being unconscious with all these different partners over the years. You can't see it. You, can, you don't know, but there's like this, there's this feeling of, you don't know what's wrong. And like, there's a disconnect in it. It was affecting you guys. So, and Azria, you you experienced celibacy as well. And I just want to dive right into that and maybe kind of give your guys' experience with that, just to kind of talk to people about that. And, you know, because it was so powerful to me. And then if you want to start and kick it off, just kind of tell that story around your, your six months and why and how powerful that was for you. Yeah, we could spend a whole podcast just with that one question. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of backstory to give a little bit of context and then, then answer your question. But, and I didn't realize what I'm about to say until I dove deep into working with ayahuasca and plant-based medicine and discovered some things about myself that I wasn't aware of. But as a child, I had a severe, as you read the book, had pretty severe learning disabilities, really couldn't read as a kid. And that caused severe insecurities. And the way that manifested in me was seeking external validation throughout my life. And as I became older, that, that expressed itself through the conquest of women and seeking more and more material wealth. Uh, and neither of those, no matter how much material wealth I accumulated or how many women I slept, I, I couldn't satiate that hole inside of me. And so I was, I was very promiscuous after my divorce and, and, and really felt that w was kind of empty. And then I went and sat and I'm trying to abbreviate this because we wrote, you know, this is a half a book, but you know, I sat with a shaman about a year and a half ago and he really looked into my soul and it was the most surreal experience. I could see like a reflection of him, like a movie in his eyes, looking into my soul. It was the most surreal experience of my life, but he saw a sexual distortion through the conquest of women. And then he said that I needed to, he, he prescribed me effectively six months of celibacy to retain my life force energy. And it wasn't just celibacy. It was no self-pleasure, no thoughts. No, I mean, we didn't kiss with tongue for, you know, six months. It was, it was, I really just turned it completely off. 
And I made a vow in that ceremony to do that. And it was, it was the craziest thing because it was like a light switch. I, we went from having a very charged sexual connection to like it being gone. There was no like transition. So it was very abrupt. Then in this vow, I, I really internally just made this commitment. And I knew in the moment I made the vow that it was, it was going to be shut off. And so, but that was very, very confronting to me because I had created an identity around my sexuality. It was a big part of who I thought I was, this false identity. And, and so leaving that identity behind, both just in general, and then also within this relationship was very confronting. We have a very beautiful sexual connection. And to take that away, there was a part of me that scared little boy that is insecure was like, what's going to be left? Is she still going to love me? Am I still worthy? right? You know, taking this, this thing that's really valuable in our relationship and removing it. And it was really, in, in the end, it was really empowering because one, our connection deepened. And so, so that was really empowering. And also just feeling worthy without that and knowing that, that I am worthy of this relationship and of, of love without my sexuality. And as a man, you know, you know, the plumbing stops working at some point, right? Like, you know, and, and so, you know, as you know, you think about like, okay, when I'm 70, when I'm 80, when the, the plumbing stops working, you know, am I going to, what's it going to be like? And so to feel our relationship deepen was just so empowering. Yeah, that was, I, mean, I think what you shared was very much kind of the psychological and, and emotional benefit that came from it. There was also more of a physiological component where it was one of the things that this medicine man saw in Benjamin was that through this unconscious engaging with many women, you know, without, yeah, just without, without awareness, without devotion, there was this, this leaking energy that had started to happen in his energy field over really many, many years. And that had gradually depleted him to the, to the point where it was like his life force energy was just kind of gone. And he was feeling that a big part of the reason that he was working with this medicine man in the first place was because he was feeling incredibly energetically depleted and like constantly fatigued, you know, years of sleep deprivation, like all of these things just kind of compounding. And so the, from a physiological perspective, stopping ejaculation or, you know, sex, sharing of sexual energy in general really helps the body replenish its own storage of life force energy that she isn't being expelled. And so it can start to build up inside of your own vessel and it can kind of recharge you and nourish and heal your system from the inside out. So I thought that was an interesting component as well, because not everyone is necessarily going to resonate with the psychological, you know, benefits that he specifically received, but, but even just from a physio physiological perspective, like you can, you can recharge your body in that way. Yeah. And we even practice now semen retention where when I orgasm, you know, retain the semen for that same life force energy to stay. And so I actually ejaculate much less frequently, frequently when we have sex for the same reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that hit me and I was just thinking about it because, you know, when I sat with Aya last year, I went like 45 days. So that was, oh. that was the longest I've ever I've ever gone. I've never really thought about doing it, but I remember how I felt in ceremony and just in general, this, this charge. And then when you were talking about it, I was like, oh man, I think I got like, cause there, I was living the same sort of lifestyle, right? <clears throat> you know, very unconscious. And I think a lot of people can relate to that, right? You, you want to call in your queen or your king or sacred union, but you have all this energy that's like all, I don't know, for better words, fucked up, right? I mean, it's, you, you don't know. And I, I'm kind of wondering if that's happened to me and a lot of listeners, like what, you know, why, what's the problem? Like what's going on? Why are we not calling in our partners? And when you guys were talking about that, I was, I really, it resonated with me. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about that around like calling in your, your person. For sure. I think the cord cutting was also another big component, right? Yeah. On our website, we, I put a video on there that this, this shaman taught me an energetic cord cutting ritual, which you can, you can find on the resources tab of our websites. 
a tool, sorry, but where we take you through a, a process of energetically cutting those cords with, with, so he invited me to do that for every single person I've ever slept with. And unfortunately I didn't even remember some of the names. <laughs> yeah. When he said I, that, I was like, how are you going to remember that, bro? <laughs> I, I did the best I could, but that was really, you know, it's, it's all part of it is energetically cord cutting. And even with people I have, I still have relationships with, and it doesn't have to be sexual. I cut, I cut cords with my children, with my ex-wife, with, with pretty much all the people that I've ever had any conflict with that I can remember because it's not about severing a relationship. It's about giving them back the energy that's theirs and, and, and calling back, claiming the energy that's yours. And so it's, it can even happen in, you could be husband and wife and cut cords and say, I, I want to like reset this situation and, and give you back your energy and take back what's mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just, it's really putting back into harmony the, the energies in relationship. In terms of calling in your person, I think that there's definitely, you know, I think there's definitely this, certainly in the conscious community, this sense of like, well, when I'm fully whole and complete and healed, like then the other person will show up, you know? Yeah. And I think there certainly gets to be a, a, a solid commitment to that, to being whole and healed and, you know, fully sovereign in your, in yourself. But I think the reality is that a lot of times it requires a mirror, you know, another person to actually show up to reveal to you and illuminate to you all the places where you still have work to do that you can't necessarily even see on your own. So it's kind of a paradox in a way, because it's the commitment to that that allows you to manifest that person. And it's the willingness to, to, to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim that this is what I believe I'm worthy of receiving in partnership. And this is, you know, the kind of quality of relationship that I, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm going to be, <clears throat> you know, wholeheartedly committed to, to the point where I'm not allowing other energies to come in that aren't in alignment with that. Right. That was a big thing for Benjamin was like really stopping the kind of the, this, this unconscious pattern of constantly dating or being with women that he knew he knew deep down wasn't really going to last just because it was easy or because it was fun or whatever the reason was. So before meeting me, he, he started to really feel like that shift in, in, in his own consciousness. And he started to really pull back and as you say, kind of become still and let go of that need to engage in that. And that was the prerequisite to, to me showing up. So that was a very necessary step. But then obviously, if you read the book, you'll see that there was still a lot of inner work that needed to happen for both of us, really, even once we entered into the relationship. And the relationship became the vehicle for the transformation. It became this really accelerated kind of cauldron of transformation that we were, through the commitment to each other, like engaged in and, and through the constant reflection and the, the ability to see these aspects of ourselves that were normally shrouded in the you know, in our blind spot, we were able to very dramatically evolve and grow in directions that were at times really painful. So it's, it's a yes. And as is often the case. Yeah. And sometimes it's not what you do, but it's how, the energy with which you're doing it. And so for me, there, there's a real difference between calling in your, 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 your partner, you know, from an energy of, of, of there's that you can be doing it from an energy of lack, from an energy of seeking, which is a shadow frequency, right? Or you can be doing it because you want to experience the full richness of life and part and experiencing the full richness of life is being in partnership, right? In relationship with, with maybe your soulmate, maybe, you know, your friends, but, but really being fulfilled in those relationships. And so the same energy can be, can come from an energy of lack, which is, which is where I spent many, many years in this seeking from a place of lack. And it, until I really became still and was like, no, my queen's going to show up in my field. Was I able to receive her? Mm. Right. And so it's, it's, it's preparing your safe, yourself to be able to receive what you're calling in is, is I think where the real magic happens. Right. Because it's so easy to download these apps, especially let's say in Mexico, right? I'm a single guy. There's a lot of single people out here. It's so easy to just allow it to just consume our energy for no reason. It's like, 
what the fuck am I talking to this person for? Like, it doesn't, you know, you don't have any intention of it being anything, but it's almost like this validation thing. So like when you were talking about that, I could just, it resonated with me because it was like, man, how much time has been spent on this with no intention of this person ever like turning into anything. And how many people do that on a daily basis? Like no intention with what they're doing. They're just doing it because it's, they're getting this kick. Oh, somebody wants me. Somebody likes me, you know? And then they, they invest this energy in these people that really don't, there's, they don't see anything with them. So, and then you were talking about that too. Like if you don't see them being your future partner, then what is, you know, what's the point? Well, you're out of integrity with yourself. Yeah. Right. If, if that's the intention, right? If your intention and your deeper soul's knowing is to call in that partner, then anything that's not that is going to be out of integrity. Like I was, I was coaching a, a client who was actively working on this and he's like, why is she not showing up? Why is she not showing up? And he was, when we were actually taking inventory of his life, you know, he was again, just same thing, dating all these girls that he knew were not going to be the thing, you know? And I was like, He's like, so wait, are you saying like, I'm not supposed to have fun, you know, like until she shows up, am I not supposed to have fun? You know, when these are like people that I actually, maybe they're not the one, but I care about them, you know, and, and we have a beautiful time together. And so it's not like it's completely empty. And I just said, all you have to do when you're trying to make these decisions, like on a Friday night, you know, what, how am I going to spend my evening? Am I going to go hit up this chick and go have dinner with her, even though it's like, you know? Or am I going to be home, you know, doing my inner work, reading the books that I know is going to, it's all, all you have to do is just simply ask the question, is this taking me closer or fur, further away from who I say I want to be? So a lot of the work we did was around him really <clears throat> stepping into that timeline of the version of himself that he kept saying he wanted to be, which was this deeply committed partner this, this husband, this father, this, this person that he was said he was claiming that he was ready to be. And so every choice then he, he get, he got to filter through that lens of, okay, if this is the GPS set point, you know, is, is this decision I'm making in the present moment, bringing me one step further or one step closer. And if I, if I just use that as a simple tool, it can really dramatically affect the way that I show up in my life. And it was really tough for him in the beginning because when he started using that, there was a lot of things he started to say no to that he, you know, he wanted to, some part of him still wanted to engage in. So it was a gradual process of kind of untethering himself from this default way of being. And at, for a moment feeling kind of lonely because he's like, well, now I'm not going out on a Friday night. I'm not doing the thing, yeah. you know, and I'm sitting in my apartment. I could be having fun, but like it's for, it's in service to something greater. And that devotion, because that's the energy of devotion ultimately, is what makes you a vibrational match to the person that can meet you in that same energy of devotion, right? Because we attract more of what we already. Yeah. I mean, that awareness is so key. And it's, and then when you take that away, you realize how much time and energy you, you put in that. It's like, wow, okay. Then there's so much other stuff to work on and do, you know, and yeah, you know, that's why that hit me. And it was working in the bars and being an athlete my whole life. It was just like, I've realized how much that has literally taken my entire, made my identity of who I am and validation. When you take that away. It's like, well, who the fuck, who am I without that stuff? So it's a, it's a great way for me to reflect on too. And I think a lot of people out there who are listening, like, can relate. So thank you for going into that in the book, because I think it's so powerful and there's so much more about it. I also want to, so I, there's, I talk about psychedelics on here, but I haven't for a while. And that's why I'm excited to have you guys on because it kind of like revisits this area. Like I, I sat with Aya last year and people always ask me about my experience on different podcasts. And it's been something that I haven't really brought up lately but there's a lot of new listeners lately and i haven't discussed it so i would love i love the way you explained plant or psychedelics and plant medicine and i would love if you could maybe just walk the listeners through that may there's a lot of beginners in this, this space that are listening on here so i would love if you could kind of walk us through why 
why psychedelics are so powerful and maybe speak to ayahuasca and why you guys have decided to use them in your life and how they've sort of helped you. If that's, I know it's a bit of a loaded question, but I would, I would just love if you could speak to that, Azria, because I think you did a great job with kind of, even when I was listening to it, I was like, man, I wish I could explain it like that. The experience, <laughs> that I, you know, it was the way you said it was so great. And I think a lot of listeners could get value from it. Yeah. So there's kind of two parts, I guess, to start distinguishing between like a psychedelic in a more, more recreational sense and then like a, a ceremonial plant medicine experience. And there's a pretty big difference between the two. And both have value, by the way, and both are useful in different ways. Both have served us in our relationship. Sometimes the recreational LSD journey on the beach has been like the most magical healing experience, you know, and it's what we needed. And both have shadows as well. So, so, so I think there's kind of a differentiation there. And a lot of it, you know, always boils down to intention. What is really the, the why behind the reason that you're choosing to alter your consciousness in this way. Psychedelics in the, in the more recreational sense, like the LSD, you know, MDMA kind of category is the, the beauty of those medicines for us personally is that because they're synthetic, they're very predictable, I think, in how they show up in the body. So if I take either of those two examples, I kind of know I'm going to have a pretty predictable outcome. Of course, my, you know, my energy, my intention, the surroundings, the people I'm with is going to affect the experience, but more or less, it's going to be fairly consistent. Now, what's missing in that is, be is because it's a synthetic compound and because it's so predictable, it's also missing some of the complexity and the nuance that like a plant medicine has, for example, where you have the whole plant intact. You have the, the whole, uh, the DNA of the plant, the spirit of the plant, right? The lineage of the tradition that, for example, ayahuasca is held in. That also deeply affects your experience of the work. So my experience of working with ayahuasca or psilocybin, for example, is that because these are natural earth-based compounds, you know, that are completely whole, still and i'm 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 kind of communing with them in that way i can connect to a, a more nuanced and complex kind of personality behind the the compound so it's not just there's a molecule that i'm taking that's altering my consciousness but i'm actually having a conversation with the personality or the spirit of this plant energy which is a very different thing and so there's a time and place for both and i think that you know you're seeing mdma do really well in like ptsd studies and stuff is because it's, it creates a very replicable kind of safe effect. If you're in the right container, it's going to open your heart. It's going to allow you to look at trauma in a way that you maybe wouldn't have been able to access before, right? And that can be very good for like a clinical. Ayahuasca specifically, which has been our main teacher, is much more on the unpredictable side. Like, as you know, no journey is ever the same, right? So we go in and we have an intention and we sort of just have to surrender to whatever is going to happen. And even though we can control certain things like who's serving the medicine, where does the medicine come from, how well prepared am I, you know, how clean is my vessel, how pure is my intention, all of these things will affect your journey. At the end of the day, the medicine has the steering wheel and it's going to take you where it needs to take you. And sometimes it's going to take you into the heights of the most exquisite states of bliss. And sometimes it's going to thrust you into the bowels of hell, you know, and force you to look at all the shit that you don't want to look at. Whatever the thing is, we deeply trust that the medicine knows better than we do and is going to give us always, you know, what we need, not necessarily what we want. So, yeah. So that's kind of like the distinction that I would kind of start the conversation with. And then for us, you know, we integrated psychedelics and plant medicine into our relationship from the very beginning. If you read our book, it kicks off with a, with a pretty intense psychedelic journey that really helped us. Within a couple of weeks, yeah, <laughs> within a couple of weeks, it helped us really collapse and sort of annihilate all of the defense mechanisms and the boundaries and the fears that came up for us in the beginning when we first met, because in the, in the, in the intensity of like falling in love with each other, there was also a lot of fear that got kicked to the surface, you know, fear around compatibility around like, what does this all mean? You know, it, it was the kind of connection that was so potent that it was, it was making an impact on our lives in a dramatic way. And, and the, but the consequences of that impact weren't 100% clear in the beginning because we were still getting to know each other. And there were some misalignments that we could sense in terms of how we were both wired. And that got really scary pretty quickly. So that journey, for example, the one I'm referencing on the beach in Tulum was this opportunity for us to just like 
release all of this fear, all of these defense mechanisms and just see each other through this lens of pure love, really, and just give ourselves completely to the magic of this connection. And in that opportunity, in that portal, we were able to commit to each other in a way that may have taken us otherwise, you know, six, 12 months. And plant medicine are really an accelerator, I would say. They are not, they're not the magic pill. They certainly aren't the, the heal all, you know, solution to all of our problems, but they accelerate the possibilities of what's already present in the moment inside of you. And if you're willing to go on the fast track and you're willing to feel a lot of things, both positive and, you know, quote unquote negative, not that there really is such a thing, but if you're willing to get uncomfortable, let's say, then they can be a powerful tool to help you quantum leap in your development, whether it's as a couple or just in your own personal journey. And with ayahuasca in particular, that medicine I think is really it's 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 maybe the most mind-bogglingly sophisticated plant technology that I've ever come across. I mean, it's it's pretty incredible what this medicine can do and how it can facilitate transformation for people in such a short period of time. Also comes with, you know, a higher risk factor, right? Like you're opening your consciousness in a way that is can be really scary and confronting to a lot of people. And if you're not ready for that, it can also backfire. So we've done a lot of deep, deep, deep excavation with ayahuasca. And it's helped us pull back so many layers. It's helped us do shadow work at a, you know, at a, at a subconscious level that just with the other tools that we had, we wouldn't have been able to access. And yeah, it's been a blessing. And also there's a time and place, you know, there was a time in the beginning where we were working a lot with psychedelics and plant medicine. And now we're really on the other side of that. We've kind of stabilized in a beautiful place and we know, we know what we're doing with our lives. We've received the instructions and and the gifts and the lessons and we, we've integrated them and now it's time to share them with the world so that period of like deep heavy lifting is kind of complete for us now not to say that it, you know we won't go through another phase but at this stage it feels also really good to have to, to not be dependent on the medicine and say okay like this has to be a constant thing yeah i would just say we also don't proclaim we don't state that a med the psychedelics are for everybody please consult a doctor, you know, all that good stuff. And really in a serious way, there's a lot of people serving medicine that should not be, do a lot of research before you enter a container and make sure before you decide to go on, on a journey that you have support after, during and after, because integration can be, can be a real thing and you need to be supported because sometimes it brings to the surface things that you weren't prepared to deal with, which is beautiful because it allows you to, to actually feel things fully transmute them and, and move forward in your life, but it can be very uncomfortable. And so it's really important to have people in your life that have been there, have gone on this journey, can help hold your hand through this process because it can be intense. And, you know, we, we, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of horror stories of people who've, you know, gone to a ceremony in a container they didn't know, and then didn't know how to handle it after it didn't have a support team. So just, just invite everyone to be very intentional and cautious. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree that in, the integration is so important too. I think people don't really value enough at times, you know, it's like, have you done your homework? If you haven't done your homework, then what do you expect? Right? Like there's, yeah, I, I feel like I've seen the real so, work starts after, after the retreat, after the ceremony. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I feel also that and I'd love to hear your opinion as well, is that I feel like some people go from ceremony to ceremony, and I've heard this, they're chasing different answers. They don't, it's almost like they don't want the answers they got. So instead of integrating that, it's like, I oh, know I want a different one. I want a different one. I want a different one. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, what's true and what's not? And that's, I love to ask you that as, as to like when, if somebody is doing ceremonies, you know, when is the time to do the next one versus sit with this one for a bit? I know it's different for everybody, but what are your thoughts on that as far as, as time or, you know, what should you be looking for in your life when you feel it's time for another one or to integrate? Like, how do you discern between that? 
I guess I would say is one, there's no, there's no answer, yeah. real answer for that question. It, it really depends. I've had ceremonies where, you know, I'm sitting two weeks apart from each other and I have at times where I, I'm like, I think I need a year to integrate that ceremony. And I think the question you could even take it beyond, you know, this question about plant-based medicine and really discernment in general, because, you know, you could say, how do I discern in the question that you just asked, or how do I discern if this is the, my partner I should be with, or if I should enter this business or whatever it is. And I think, I think the, the key is really learning to listen to yourself, to your body, to the intelligence of your body, to the inter- intelligence of life. And I think that that comes with a certain level of maturity. And I think that we, we get to hone that, that, that muscle and practice discernment. And we have this saying in the book to, I use my full fuck yes to discern what I want most over what I want now. And the full fuck yes is really, it, 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 that's easy to say, but it's what is your full fuck yes? And what, you know, to listen to your body, that whole body, yes, right? It requires a lot of practice and stillness. And so we invite people to say, okay, like when's the last time you were very certain uh, about something you just knew with every cell in your body? What did it feel like? Where did you feel it in your body? you know, for people, for different people, they might feel that different, but to actually listen to yourself, to, to the intelligence of your own body and to be in guidance with spirit. We often ask ourselves like, well, we want to, we want to do this thing. And then it doesn't seem like it wants to align. It's like, well, is the universe wanting to point instead of being like, you know, I want to get to this finish line, this goal, I want to buy this house, but the deal just doesn't seem to want to happen. And sometimes it's like, well, step back and listen, maybe the universe is pointing you to something different. A lot of times when you, when you step back and you honor that and say, okay, this doesn't want to happen. It feels like I'm trying to force this. I'm trying to force this relationship to work. Well, maybe the, the universe is trying to help me actually point me in another direction. And so those are, you know, I'm, I'm getting meta to your question, but the, the real answer is discernment and listening. And, and I, the other thing is just have people around you that love you. Uh, that care about you, that are that are also open minded, not closed minded. Sorry, there's a, a siren. Mexico City have a support uh, network that can help you too when you're in the question, right? The people that that love you and 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 are open minded and can can help you through that. Yeah, for sure. I think discernment is such a powerful thing that we don't really learn. Like when do we learn how to discern? How do, when do we learn how to really listen? And this is also you know, the listening or the receiving of the more subtle ways in which our body mind communicates is a lost art. I think it's also, you know, in the repression of the feminine energy in general on our planet, we've kind of lost that ability. We're so driven to achieve and to measure and to succeed in in external ways that if we take that same mechanism and apply it to spirituality or personal development, we're just in the same loop of chasing some future finish line that promises us happiness when in reality, my experience of plant medicine is that it's always pointing me back to what is actually present right now. So there's, there is no, there is no, I'm going to be happy over here. Even if I'm thrown into deep, deep grief, that is the gift of the present moment. That is the only thing that's real. And, and the only practice you could argue of integration is to fully receive the blessing of what is now, even if what is now is wildly uncomfortable and kind of the opposite of what you thought you wanted. And that's the real, that's the real mastery, I think. And we, we talk about it in the book, we call it becoming unfuckwithable. And becoming unfuckwithable is not what it might sound like. It, it sounds like, oh, we're immune, you know, nothing, nothing hurts us, nothing penetrates us. But it's quite the opposite. It's actually, you become unfuckwithable when you realize that you can't escape pain and suffering. Things are always going to come your way that are going to be uncomfortable, that are going to be difficult, that are going to be challenging. And the only way to, to be unfuckwithable in the face of that is to receive those feelings fully and allow the sensations of those feelings to fully come into your system and to process them, to welcome them and to allow them because they're here to teach you something. Mm-hmm. And if we could just not be in resistance to those things, then life would start to get a lot easier. And in a way, the medicine ceremony, especially ayahuasca, is kind of a microcosm of that because the more you fight, the, the more you resist the uncomfortable parts of it, the harder it gets, right? This is a very common theme that people experience. It's like, if you're trying to control the experience, you're trying to force it to be something that it doesn't want to be, 
you're you're going to start to suffer very quickly because it's this instant feedback mechanism of like, just let go, let it be what it wants to be. So I think integration is, yeah, it's a, it's a word that we're hearing more and more in these communities because I think more and more people are burning out on the constant ceremony circuit or the constant so plant medicine circuit and realizing like it's not actually getting me closer to where I want to go in the long run. But sometimes we have to exhaust ourselves before we're ready to really sh- change. And sometimes that exhaustion is also a gift, mm. right? Because if you look at it from that lens of everything is a gift and life is constantly giving us an opportunity to evolve, there's no mistake. You can't do it wrong. Even if you did, you know, 50 ceremonies out of integrity, you needed to do those 50 ceremonies out of integrity to get you to a place where you realize that's not going to get you where you want to go. And eventually you'll get the lesson, right? You can decide at which speed you want to get the lesson sometimes. But yeah, and the other thing I would say too is, this is a big one that I've had to really work on in integration is like, sometimes it's not clear. Sometimes when you're trying to get the answer and you're trying to discern and and listen for the answer, you're not getting a clear answer. And sometimes you'll get a clear answer for a while. And it's like, what the fuck? I should be, I should know, right? I should have clarity. But sometimes the gift is not knowing. Sometimes the gift is actually just letting yourself truly not know. And if you don't know, that's okay. Can you fully wholeheartedly not know? And that's liberating to to not feel like you need to know all the time. So if you don't fully know, then maybe just hold off, you know, clear. And maybe it'll take six months or it'll take two years or it'll take five minutes. We don't know. But can you embrace that as well? I think that's a that's a big one for me. Yeah. And also the, the, there's really, you never really know, like it's it, when you go really meta, like you never really know. And, and the opposite of learning is knowing. And so you, the, the minute you think, you know, then you stop, you know, learning. And so the, the real, the, when you, the real magic is when you learn that it's dancing and the uncertainty is the goal, not, <laughs> not knowing that the knowing isn't the goal that the learning to dance in the uncertainty is actually the goal. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's funny. What just came up for me was actually from ayahuasca. What it was like, she, whenever I thought I had it figured out, she would go, you don't fucking know anything. And then she would just throw me on a, on a ride. So it's like, so true. Cause even when we think we know, we don't. And it's like, that's, it's so beautiful to trust that. And I think so many people want to control the outcome that we're, they're unwilling to sort of just trust the unknown. And most people don't trust the unknown. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a real practice to get comfortable in that place, but that's the game of it is to, because learning to dance in that uncertainty is, is what, what is that? That's (laughs) trust. That's trust. And that is the, the whole, the whole, the goal is trust and so the, that learning to dance is really just learning to trust. If somebody is thinking about the full fuck yes, can you explain how somebody can get clearer on that? Like, are you saying, to break it down, are you kind of saying that's your deep intuition versus your ego? And like to strengthen that intuition is going to give you the stronger fuck yes? Or how can somebody that, likes that term be like, I want to know how to get the fuck. Yes. Like what's the better? How can I do that? In the matrix, we have this quote that we use in the matrix. I think it's the, the Oracle says it. Yeah. She says, how do you know you're in love? And the answer she gives is you, you just know through and through from your balls to the bone, from your bones that I love you. And so, and so it's, it's really, I think the is, is learning to listen to yourself, find stillness so that you, that full fuck. Yes. You just know from your balls to your bones. And I think it's, it's discerning that from everything else. And we also like to say the hardest no to identify is the one closest to a yes. And so it's getting discernment of like, you know, the, the full fuck yeses are actually not that difficult to, no. to discern. Like, you know, those. And the no's are pretty easy. The, the real difficult part is to identify the no that's really close to a yes. And, and like I said before, I think it's finding stillness and, and listening to your body in a way that, that, that will help you find clarity around that. Yeah. And, you know, 
there's a lot of contradiction also in what we're saying, right? Because on the one hand, it's like, you can't know anything and it's all about the uncertainty. On the other hand, we talk about the knowing, the all caps knowing in the book, which is kind of like that non-negotiable knowing that is beyond your logical intellectual mind. That's just sort of intrinsically a part of your innate, you know, ancient intelligence that you can tap into. And so I think it's discerning between the different layers of knowing. The full fog yes for me specifically is very tethered to my feeling of aliveness. Like how alive is this thing making me feel? If, if it's like activating my full aliveness, it's a full fuck yes. If it's kind of disconnecting me from my aliveness, it's probably not. Now, again, nothing is black and white, right? Because even this concept, if you sort of apply it to a long enough timeline, you're going to find more nuances and distinctions. For example, my full fuck yes is to create and birth becoming, which is our, our, our you know, our mission, our, our organization that we're birthing. And it's a massive venture. And I have been at times fueled by this sense of incredible aliveness and just inspiration and enthusiasm. And then also there's been times where I'm tired and I'm holding a lot and I'm answering emails and I'm dealing with logistics and, you know, I'm, I'm birthing a business. So there's a tremendous amount of stuff that comes with that, that maybe isn't my full fuck yes, isn't making me feel super fucking alive and excited, but it's in service to the larger full fuck yes that I'm committed to. Does that make sense? So it's like, it's it's layered. You mean, yeah. Right. And it's the same in relationship because you could say, oh, well, if it's not a full fuck yes, like I'm out, but sometimes the full fuck yes, it's, it's a full fuck yes at the purest soul level. But then when the ego and all the distortions and all the trauma gets brought up, we can start to question if it's really a full fuck yes, because it starts to feel hard. And it's like, yeah. shit, I have to work at this now. You know, is this really something that, or should I maybe go over here where it's, it's, it feels easier? There's this new person, there's this new opportunity. Like maybe that's my full fuck yes. So it's, it's not about getting sucked into the illusion that things should always be fun and easy and exciting. Mm. It's about trusting that the full fuck yes is kind of like a compass. It, it shows you what's real and true inside of you. It's alive and exciting. And then sometimes being in service to that over a longer period of time requires you to also make love to the more boring parts or to the parts that are not as exciting. But again, it's what is the larger overall intention? And if that's a full fuck yes, then you're, then you're in a good place. Yeah. And then it comes down to as well, because I'm, I'm thinking about it as well in my own life, controlling your emotional state, your energy, because if you don't take care of your body, don't do the things in the morning, you don't do the breath work, you don't do the meditation, then you're going to be looking at life through a cloudy lens and things that may be a fuck yes may not be. So it's like you almost have to do what you can do to get your state, your emotional state to a a place that's like, okay, now it's a clear lens today. Exactly. Right. And then, and then how things flow, because you know, if you have a big night out or you, you know, you're not eating well, you're not working out, your, your things, there's going to be, it's, it's going to be harder to tell what's a fuck yes. Right. It's going to be Absolutely. like, is, is this, is this true? Or is this just me being, you know, dehydrated or too much coffee? Like there's a lot that we can, we can do to control our state. Absolutely. Right. And also acknowledge that we're all novelty horrors. Like deep yeah. down, we're all novelty horrors, meaning we like new things. Right. That's kind of just how we're wired as humans. We're like, oh, look at that new shiny object over there. Right. Yeah. And so to build something of that can last, whether it's in romantic relationship or it's pas- being passionate about your business or what you're creating in the world, like if you want to build something that's going to last and be significant, you're going to have to start falling in love with sameness. You're going to have to find a way to keep, like you said, that lens fresh on what is actually happening in your life instead of being distracted by the novelties that life may tempt you with that could potentially pull you away from something that could be really deep and profound. And I think that's an art too that is really lost and not something that we're, you know, that we cultivate in our culture. So it's something to, to, to practice and you have to really practice it. It's not necessarily like the full fuck yes comes easy, right? falling in love in a way it's easy it's like your body's doing half the work for you yeah <laughs> flooding you with all these feel good hormones and chemicals and stuff but but to generate this the, the, the profoundness and the beauty and the connection 
long after that that initial leg, leg up from biology is is sort of gone is is a different thing it's a different attitude a different mentality and having tools is so important and that's why in the book we also give a lot of links to tools as well as reflection questions because we want people not just to read the book and be like wow that was you know cool or inspiring or entertaining but we really want people to apply this to their own lives and do the work mm. yeah yeah i think it's super important to take the time to kind of contemplate some of the points that you guys talk about in there to like give it honor the space to it because it's it's a lot there's a it's lot, a lot. <laughs> but it's you you listen to the audiobook. I'd be curious. I, I can't imagine listening to the audiobook and not having the hardcover because there's so many questions, so many things. Like, how, how do you intend to integrate it? Well, you know, I'm probably, I'm going to go, I haven't listened to the interviews at the end. I want to listen to those, you know, because I just finished it last night. And when I listen to it, I'm usually walking or I'm on the treadmill, but I like how you guys gave it a, people a warning in the beginning, like, you know, pay attention, put the other shit away. Don't get distracted. I liked it because I needed to hear that. I was like, oh yeah, good call. All right. So I'm like, I'm going to like, because it's, it's important because how many times do we not give the thing its attention that we're doing? Especially me, I'm always distracted with stuff on my phone. I'm like, wait a minute. No, let's sit with this. And when I sat with it, this was a great lesson for everybody listening. Like give yourself that space because what you're saying takes time to, to to absorb and i had to rewind a couple times and be like i want i need to hear that again and i you know i would like to kind of go through the prompts again and you're right i wish i had some i, I haven't looked at the pdf yet if i'm being honest but it was i can't imagine going through that book any other way other than hearing your guys' voices now that i've heard it i mean reading it would be great but i would i i love hearing the voices of it because it feels like you're you have your own unique your 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 own spin to what you're saying and it is are, are, are you telling the listeners that they need to listen to the book and buy the book that, <laughs> yeah at the I same can... at the same time yeah that's a good idea actually i think i i did that a couple of times with a book in the past where you like have it open and then you actually have them he does that all the time i, I have i have three challenges reading so i actually do that with almost all books and i read them to i listen to it with the hardcover in front of me and i listen to it at one and a half for two times normal speed the speed actually forces me to focus so faster actually helps me focus more, but it's been a huge, like, you know, game changer for me. I plow through books now in it, doing that. So yeah. Tell me about a little bit about your, your, your fear around this. Cause you talked about, you did a great job by the way, bro. You did um, a great job. <laughs> tell me about your dyslexia. Like, can you speak to that a little bit? Because I think a lot of people feel they may have that. I feel I may in certain ways. Sometimes it's kind of like, tell me a little bit about your journey with that. And yeah, I guess I'll start at the end. Reading the audio book was extremely challenging. And in what, you know, I, you build a life around your skills and us, and also to avoid the things you're not good at. And so I, 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 I never really read out loud because it triggers PTSD from being a child, but reading the audiobook, you know, I read about, you know, we have the three voices, the we, Asriel's and mine. And so I, I was about a third of the book and that third probably took four times as long as it took Asriel to read the other two. She was like bouncing between this British accent and her normal voice. And it was just like seamless. And I was like a buffoon. So I had to re-record a lot of it. And I would walk out of there just dripping and sweaty. Because even right now, if you, if you gave me something I wasn't, I'd never read before and said, read it out loud right now on this podcast, I would immediately go into like cold sweats and it's just a childhood thing, PTSD. But as a kid, I couldn't really read and not to say I was illiterate. I could read the words, but I would read them so slowly that I, by the time I finished the paragraph, I couldn't remember what I was reading because I would be so focused on pronouncing the word so, so slowly that I, I was just so focused on the pronunciation. I couldn't remember the words. And so I would read a paragraph five times in a row and not know what I read. And because it was so slow, then I would kind of go off and my, I would, I would daydream because it was so slow. That's why I listened to books so fast because the focus, the speed helps me focus. And so I really struggled. I didn't really read until I got into college. I don't even know how I got into college. I barely graduated high school. And then I kind of learned, you know, I, I kind of grew out of it a bit. I'm, I still am a poor reader, but certainly can read, you know, fairly 
well considering. And I found life hacks. Like I listen to audiobooks while I have the hardcover in front of me and that's just saved my life. And I read, you know, a ton, I, you know, sometimes I'm reading a book a week. And so that's been really, you know, empowering to kind of grow out of, but it, it also, I didn't realize it until I started working with ayahuasca that, you know, I, I over my life, I'd be like, why am I insecure? I've, I have this massive business, thousands of employees, yeah, beautiful wife, beautiful girlfriend, whatever it might be. Why am I feeling this insecurity? Why do I feel so unworthy of being in this room with these high powered CEOs? Why do I feel unworthy of the woman who, who I just slept with? You know, why is there where there's this imposter syndrome that I'm carrying around? And I didn't realize you know, through all the personal development work, I couldn't really figure it out because I felt like I had this loving childhood, but I, I was able to finally excavate that it was, there was a correlation between the scared little boy that couldn't read and my insecurities. Cause it, you know, I, you know, if you said, am I insecure about reading? I would say yes, but why does that translate it to being a CEO or, or a husband? And until I really started working with ayahuasca, was I able to really excavate the, the true reason. And then I'll, and then actually allow myself to feel those feelings fully. And the awareness has been so empowering. Uh, and so it's not to say that I'm like figured it all out and I'm perfect, but I've, no? well, according to you, <laughs> I should be perfect. Wait, I signed up for perfect. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's really just helped me finally, like all the, there was, I didn't realize it. I like to say I carried, I spent my entire life in this perpetual state of anxiety. But I didn't realize I was in a state of anxiety. And I use this analogy of like, if you imagine if you were born, there was a fan in the background and it was, there was a humming and it was just always there. And one day somebody unplugged the fan and all of a sudden the humming was gone. And you're like, holy shit. I thought what I thought was silence isn't, wasn't silence. And that's how it was for me with anxiety. I didn't realize I had anxiety and all of a sudden it was like lifted off of me. And I was like, oh shit, like this tension in my shoulders was like, it, it's, 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 I now know what it feels like to walk around without this perpetual state of anxiety. And it was, the truth is, is that anxiety was that scared little boy who couldn't read that when he left the comfort of his home and went into this, to the, to the world, which was school at that time, it was unsafe. And so leaving the comfort of your home was not a safe thing. And so I felt unsafe and I felt anxious in the world. And I didn't realize I felt anxious. And when you would ask me, are you an anxious person? I would have said no. And so it was, it's, it was really, it's been a journey. And, and I finally was able to get to the root cause of why I was feeling these insecurities. And it's been so empowering. And now it's like when I read the book out loud and I get all, I can like laugh at the scared little boy, even if I, you know, fumble the words around a little bit, I can kind of laugh at it because I know where it's coming from. So it's been super empowering. Yeah. You've, you found compassion for that part of yourself. Yeah, I can laugh out about it too a little bit. Like, it's like, okay, here we go again. <laughs> yeah, anxiety is a funny thing. I had it my whole life too, and I didn't even really realize it also until it goes away and you're like, whoa. And, you know, that's why, yeah, like anxiety has always been something that's held me back, which led me to drink so much because it was the thing that allowed me to escape that feeling. Anxiety is just such a, it's such a fucking strange thing it's so hard to understand you know because it's different for everybody and some people don't even know that they're being anxious yeah and even a lot of people know they they are but don't understand why yeah and and you know there there a lot of times you asked earlier about the medicine and why it's been so powerful for us is our egos you know are this our defense mechanisms these walls that we create to, to protect us are actually doing the opposite of protecting us. They're actually keeping us from, from being fully alive. And sometimes some of us like myself are, you know, have pretty strong egos, identities and walls up and plant-based medicine, ayahuasca has been particular, has been so powerful to get beyond that, to actually go to the root cause of it and actually allow you to feel those things fully. And it's in the feeling, the, the fear, like I've, I've had some extremely, extremely, extremely challenging ayahuasca ceremonies and, and, and I, during it, I knew they were beautiful because I knew it was getting to a place that I wasn't allowing myself to get to in my conscious, my normal state. Right. And so I had to get into an altered state 
to actually get past my ego and my defense mechanisms to feel all those feelings that I was repressing and suppressing those childhood feelings so that I actually could feel them fully and actually move past them. And that's what allowed me to actually release that anxiety I was carrying around was because I was able to finally find a modality. And we don't think it's plant-based medicine for every somebody. Some people find that with breath work and have the most life-changing breath work experiences or meditations or cold plunges or, you know, doing some extreme sports, right? But it's getting out of your normal conscious mind and, and creating a an environment that will allow you to feel the things that you're not, you weren't, your conscious mind, your identity isn't allowing you to feel. Yeah, I would say sim- this anxiety is always the symptom of something deeper. Yeah. Like anxiety, it's an interesting thing because we use it like this word is, once you put a word on something and you label something, it's like now it's this entity where it just sort of exists like in a vacuum. Yeah. But it doesn't. Anxiety is just the tip of the iceberg of something that's deeper. And at the core of it is always some form of existential fear that, you know, a lot of times has happened long ago and far away, just never was fully processed. And so it's almost like the anxiety as this is just a reframe, but the anxiety is this gift. Your, your, your body's intelligence is sending you a message, you know, saying, hey, something's off. Like there's something deeper here for you to excavate. And I'm not going to flood you with the full thing right now because, you know, it would completely derail you, but I'm going to give you the sense of unease, like something is off, right? I can't fully relax. Like I, f- I feel discontent. I'm, and that's going to be lingering forever, really, until I'm willing to finally actually stop and look at this thing. So uh, to me, these quote unquote negative emotions or disorders that we would say in our society are really all just profound gifts and messengers from our body trying to bring our attention to something that needs love. Yeah. <laughs> I used to not be able to get on airplanes without slamming like double vodka sodas because my anxiety was so bad. Wow. I was, when I was dating my, my last girlfriend from a few years back, I used to have to sneak when she went to the bathroom, I'd have to sneak to the bar to slam drink. Cause I, my anxiety was so bad on the plane. Wow. It's crazy. But it, you like meditation for all you guys listening, like having that every single day or something where, you, yeah, like meditation or breath work or going to the gym or saunas consistently every day, it really helps. Yeah. Like it really, it's amazing to see the difference. And then when you take it away, it's like, oh, that's back. Well, that's yeah. a weird feeling. That's back. <laughs> Once you have that contrast though, it's, that's also a gift, right? Yeah, you're no, gonna, it is. You're going to move through these cycles of forgetting and remembering like what really serves you. Yeah. And it's just normal as part of it as you continue to stabilize. And, but the reason that these things are so powerful is because all of the things you just mentioned, right? Cold plunging, uh, breath work, meditation, saunas, sweating, you know, rigorous exercise. What do they all have in common? They get us out of our head. Mm. They get us out of our head and into all the other intelligent systems of our being, right? Which is like, like our body's intelligence, our heart intelligence. When we're meditating, we're observing our thoughts. We're not enslaved to our thoughts, meaning we're not identifying with our thoughts as like, this is my capital T truth. We're in that place of witnessing the thoughts and saying, oh, well, I'm having this thought. That's really interesting. Let me just breathe into that, right? You're using your breath to, to, to untether even just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit, just to take that millisecond gap between the witness, the awareness that's watching the thought and then the thought itself. That's the game changer. That's where all the transformation happens. And that's what integration actually is, is taking these, these things that we, we learn because the medicine does the work for us in a way, right? It, it forces us to get out of our head or, or, or collapse our defense mechanisms, but it's, it's not designed to be a permanent state. It's a highly temporary state. It's a peak experience. And so the only way that that can create lasting change is if we then take that glimpse, you know, behind the curtain, behind the veil, and we're like, holy shit, I have a reference point. I have a fucking GPS now. Like I can, I can get, I can find my way back there, but I'm going to have to actually consistently put it into practice in order to stabilize in that place. Because if I don't, it's not, it's not going to last. It's just always going to be an impermanent you know, moment. I wanted to ask you one, one or two more things. Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. you're good. You're good. <laughs> cool. Uh, no, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. I, where were we, were you going to speak to the, to that Ben or? No, no, no. It's good. 
Okay. I got distracted. No, I love that. Thank you. That was, it's great to understand because you're right. We give these words to things and it becomes, it takes away our power and it becomes this negative thing. And I love that reframe because it's a gift. And I love that because it's a messenger. Yeah. Most people go through that. And so there's another thing I wanted to talk to you about, Ben, also is that, that I resonated with you as well is, you know, you're getting, you're getting the news about your dad getting stage four pancreatic cancer. And it was the same thing that I went through in 20, in 2017. So I was like, whoa, that's crazy. And I just, I guess I wanted to ask you, that was something that I was like, I'm going to talk to him about that. How are you feeling now with everything? And how have you been able to, how has this book been for you at your healing? And, you know, where are you at now with it? With my father's death? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the day I found out my father was diagnosed, I literally went home, packed a bag and moved in with him and lived with him pretty much till he, till he died 10 months later. Um, you know, I went through, you know, all the stages, uh, you know, of grief through that process. When I, when I was living with him at first, I was really, at first I was like, okay, we're going to fight. Then I got really angry because, you know, there wasn't really good answers and I got frustrated. But the truth is, is that by the time he died, I had shifted from really grief to gratitude. And when he died, I was actually really at peace because I just, I really like, like felt deeply grateful and learned or taught myself to just lean into that gratitude. And I guess I'll share a moment. There was a moment where I was sitting on the back porch with my father and this was probably six weeks before his death. And I think, you know, the writing was on the wall, so to speak. And he, he started telling me a story about when his dad was dying. And I, I remember when his dad was dying and he would drive to go see him, you know, a couple times a week, he, he lived like three, four hours away. And he was telling me that when he would go visit him, he would go and my dad was wanting to get some like pearls of wisdom, some guidance, some anything from his father in those last, as he was visiting him in these last days. And his father never really like gave him what he was seeking. And my father was starting to really choke up and get in and really to have tears in his eyes. And I could, and I was, I was really confused at why he was telling me this story. And then I got it. He was trying to tell me that he didn't know what to tell me. And he was in the same boat that his father was in. And And what I shared with him was that there was no comparison because my father, he, they had the relationship they had was nothing like the relationship I had with my father. And I was like, you spend your entire life, not just telling me, but showing me how to live and what it is to be a man. And, and so how I feel today is I have moments where I miss him and wish he was there and wish I could talk to him. But I feel deep gratitude from, I feel just deep gratitude that, you know, so many people live their entire lives and their fathers, you know, live to a hundred years old, but don't have the relationship that I had with my father. And so I feel deep gratitude for that. And so that's how I feel about that. And then there's a second part of the question. I forgot it. Oh, it's just around like how oh, the book, the therapeutic yeah. value yeah. of it. It's interesting. One, I, I could not have written this book without Azra. She's the gifted writer. You know, I, I would helped edit and gave her my thoughts and, you know, was involved every step of the way, but she, she's the one with the, the gift for writing. I would never have written a book without her. I'm so incredibly proud of it. It is, it is, it is really a, a special, special, you know, piece of art. It was, it was the, in writing the book, there was a catharsis that happened in that, you know, some of these awarenesses that I had came through as a, you know, in the questioning, in the desire to write the book. And we, we rewrote the same book four different times from scratch, basically not scratch, but you know, really rewrote it. And it was interesting that the, the, it wasn't like coming together, but in the, it was just, just like, it wasn't clicking, but what we didn't realize at the time was we needed to live more. Like there was another six months of our life that we had to live through to actually have the Mm -hmm. last third of the book. 
but you know, some of these child conversations and some of this stuff came up through the book. It was a really, it helped in the excavation. So it was very cathartic, but I would say the piece that's maybe surprising is, is that, you know, you asked me about my father and in the same breath, you asked about the book and there's a, there's a, I felt a little contraction in my body because I don't know that he would resonate with the way I'm living my life. And I, I'm hoping that maybe today he would more than he did a year ago. I've really struggled with my relationship with my mother and I know that she doesn't fully agree and we're in a good place for a while. It was, we weren't even really speaking, but she thought I was a drug addict and didn't approve of my friends. And a lot of my, you know, lifelong friends have fallen away. And so in some ways, what it, what it's done for me, it's, it's, so there's a, there's a little bit of pain there around what would my father think of me and the way I'm living in my life? I, I, I like to believe that wherever I'm going to be five or 10 years from now, he'd be really proud of it. And there'd be moments I know that that part of the journey he would not have agreed with. And so that's difficult for me, but the medicine for me, the curriculum for me has been really in letting go of attachment to other people's perspective. I, I, I know I might not seem like it on the outside, but I'm, 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 I'm a pretty sensitive guy. And so the fact that a lot of my closest friends and my family can't see me, like, like of all my friends, I think one of them, my close, close, like lifelong friends, hardly any of them have even said, Hey, I read your book. It's amazing. Congratulations. Like it's been crickets. And so there's this, the little boy in me feels that. And it's been, but I also, because I, I'm doing so much work, I also simultaneously see the medicine and say, oh, well, my work here is to actually release attachment to their expectation and not make them wrong for feeling different. Like they're not wrong for having a different perspective. And if they don't like the way I'm living my life or they don't like the book, they're not wrong. And I'm not right. It's just a different perspective. And as I've done this work, I've learned that there's no truth with the capital T. There's many truths. And, and so when somebody shows up with a truth that's different from mine, I used to, the old me would have tried to convince and coerce and beat them over the head until they, they saw it my way. The new me is like, okay, they have a different perspective. Love that. And I've learned to do this. And so, you know, we're stepping into a world, our book is, it is also very triggering for certain archetypes, certain people, right? If, you, if you're devoutly religious, for example, you're probably not going to resonate with our book, right? Yes. And so I feel like also this this medicine that I've received by my friends and family struggling to receive the book and, and my way of life has also been, I've also known at a core, at a deeper level, that it's also building a muscle in me so that I can actually step into the world, this sensitive person, and actually be able to not, not be attached to, to, you know, the haters out there. Right. You know, so like the, we got our, one of our audio audible or Amazon reviews was like, I don't understand. You know, it was, we got one that was like terrible. And I first got it. I was like, oh, I felt that. And then I was like, okay, like there's going to be more, just let it go, you know? So uh, the book has been very cathartic. And also it's been interesting to see how in my close relationships, it's been so, so difficult. Mm. It's beautiful. Well, I mean, you're going to get those haters. They're just triggers that they see. They wish that they were doing what you guys are doing, right? Yeah. Like to see somebody in their truth fucking triggers a lot of people when they're not living in it. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that that's the beautiful thing about this book is that it does force people to think and to think outside the box. And you guys just, you told it, Azria, it was just so beautifully written. And after I wrote it, I'm like, this is essential for anybody that wants personal transformation. You know, whether it depend, doesn't matter what level they're at. It was just, it was such a great journey. And I highly recommend anybody that wants to change their perspective and grow. It's, it's such a valuable tool. So I really appreciate it. You guys, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having us. Yeah, this is, this is great. And I just want to ask one question that I don't, either of you can answer just to leave the audience with, if somebody is. If somebody's out there and they're struggling with adversity right now, they're going through some shit in their life. What is one piece of advice that you have for them that they could apply in their life today? We will both take a tech, tech one. I would say that one of the things, you know, one of the chapters in our book is the dimension that exists beyond problems. And so you could look at adversity as, as a problem or a challenge. 
And I think a fundamental thing that has helped us shift and really I've, I've learned through this relationship is the belief that if you're in resistance to those things, you're creating suffering within yourself, right? When you're in resistance to the problem or the adversity that just creates suffering. But if you believe that the intelli- the universe is benevolent and intelligent, then, then you have to believe that the universe is going to give you curriculum, right? In the form of adversity so that you can grow into a higher expression of yourself. And if you believe that, then you have to believe that as soon as you overcome that adversity, the universe is just going to give you more curriculum so you can grow into an even higher expression of yourself. And if the universe is serving you, it, those challenges are like traction for you to grow into, into the, the highest expression of yourself. And so when you start looking at problems and adversity through that lens, when something comes up, you're like, okay, fuck, there's a part of me that wishes this wasn't the, the, the case. But I know that this is just the universe. You know, I may not understand why today, but five years from now, I'll understand why I had to overcome this adversity, this awful thing. And frequently in, in our lives, in our lives for sure, and in, in the collective, those most challenging times are what forge us. And so if you start looking at life and those adversities is the, the universe actually, it's a, we call it a gift wrapped in thorns. That adversity is actually a gift for you to grow into a higher expression of yourself. And knowing that as soon as you, you pass that curriculum, you're just going to get the next level of curriculum. It's like going to school when you graduate, you know, ninth grade, what do you do? You go to 10th grade and you get more, more, more exams. And that's how the universe works. And I think it just, just that lens changes the, the adversity doesn't change, but your relationship to it changes. Mm. Yeah, I would, I would leave it at that. <laughs> that's beautiful. Powerful stuff. You guys, thank you so much. Again, um, this book was amazing. And everybody, make sure you get this book. We'll have everything in the show notes. Um, what are you guys working on? I know you're, you're working on your, your program. You have different tiers. Can you just walk us through that and where people can learn more about you if they want to get the book and other steps that they could take? Yeah, for sure. So our website's really the best place becoming with a q.me and that has all the information you can buy the hardcover there which is a really beautiful edition of the book on amazon you get the paperback which isn't as sexy but also still works and you can get the audible obviously on amazon as well and yeah we're enrolling into our two we're going to ultimately have three but right now we're actively enrolling into two transformational coaching containers which are really comprehensive and in depth so they're both just about six months long one is called becoming allies which is really for who i was five ten years ago someone who's very heart-centered very much wanting to be of service has healing gifts creative gifts to give the world but is lacking structure and clarity of direction and community and so that program is really designed to help people manifest their vision into reality specifically related to creating a more beautiful world and the other bucket is Becoming Stewards, which is basically Benjamin five, 10 years ago. So highly successful, checked all the boxes of traditional material success, you know, made all the money, had all the toys and still feeling deeply unfulfilled, looking for more purpose, looking for more meaning, looking for connection and also looking for heart-centered leadership codes, basically. And so that program is much smaller and integrates a couple of plant medicine retreats as well, whereas the Becoming Allies program is virtual, but then at the end, there's an option to, once you graduate, to start doing some in-person work with us as well, so with ceremonies. So we're really building a super significant ecosystem of transformation. We have our whole media as medicine arm as well with two documentaries in the pipeline. And we're really just starting. So the book is the very tip of the spear. We're growing our team. We're, we're expanding our capacity to share the message. And ultimately, we're just here to hopefully be of service in a way that can make people feel more alive and more connected. Amazing. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. Hope you enjoyed that episode. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast, wherever you're listening to this, hit the subscribe button or the follow button. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe and hit the bell to stay notified. Make sure to check out these guys. Make sure to check out B and Azria and their work and get their book. And if you can't get their book, get at least get their audio on Audible Becoming. It was, it's such a treat and we just kind of peeled the curtain back a little bit. But also connect with them on social media. Their, their links are in the show notes. And 
yeah, let me know what you think. Really powerful episode. And yeah, hope you got as much out of it as I did. All right. Many more amazing episodes to come. Amazing people coming on the show, you guys. So thank you. I couldn't do this without you. Much love. We'll catch you next time.